statements in the Gospel of John. Uh, the seven I am statements of our Lord Jesus Christ is recorded in the Gospel of John. We began a couple weeks ago uh, with John 8, 12, where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. That's where we began. And then last week we talked about Jesus making his statement, I am the bread of life. And today we're going to turn to the 15th chapter of John. And that's where our text is going to be. Um, but leading up to this, I just want to share a little bit of background to help us to understand what's going on at the time this was written. The preceding chapters, chapters 13 and 14, Jesus introduces his disciples to the idea that he's not going to be on the earth forever. His disciples had given everything up to follow him. Uh, they'd been completely obedient and completely dependent upon Jesus to lead them, to provide for them. And Jesus predicts his uh, betrayal in chapter 13. He says that Judas is going to turn him over uh, to the authorities so that they could arrest him. He predicts Peter's denial. And as he's saying he's going to leave this earth for a time, you can imagine the panic that was in the heart of the disciples. Uh, they didn't know which direction to go. They were completely dependent upon Jesus on his direction and his teaching and didn't know what the future had in store for them. So Jesus provided some words of comfort. Uh, we see at the beginning of chapter 14, Jesus speaks and it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go there and I prepare a room for you. And if I prepare a room for you, I'll come back to take you with me. He begins to comfort his disciples and to equip them to continue to minister and to go on in the faith, to continue in this new faith without him actually being there. In the middle of chapter 14, Jesus speaks of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and promises the Spirit of God would come upon them in his absence. And verse 14, 18 is one of my favorites. It says this, Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Jesus promises disciples, no matter where they're at, no matter what's going on in their lives, that just like God would never leave or forsake his people, Jesus would not leave his disciples disciples as orphans. He will not leave us as followers of Christ without him. He will always be present with us. And this kind of sets the background for what we're going to talk about today. This is John chapter 15 starting in verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to gather before your scriptures today. God, we thank you for, for your word, your, your statements of your son, Jesus. And God, as we open our hearts today to worship you and to hear what you have us say, God, open our hearts. May your spirit be upon us to help us to understand what it means when Jesus says, I am the true vine. God, pierce our hearts today. Help us to be obedient. Help us to draw closer to you. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. I am the true vine, declares our Lord Jesus Christ. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. These two statements are unequivocal. They don't change. There's no options. Jesus is the vine. God is the vine dresser, the gardener, the one who planted the vine. We don't see two different types of vine, two different types of gardeners. We see one, God and the Lord Jesus. But he does talk about two different branches. He talks about two different branches in verse 2. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. See, we are those branches. As people, we are the branches that Jesus is talking about. There's fruitful branches and there's branches that bear no fruit at all, but there is one true vine. Now this imagery, this vine imagery, would have easily been understood by folks in Jesus' time. But I've got to make a confession. I had to study a little bit about this and how to grow stuff because I have the brownest thumb on the face of the planet. 
I don't know. I don't understand this imagery because if I try to plant something, it dies. That's just my life. I can't garden. So for me to really understand this, I had to spend some time really thinking about what's going on and not taking this imagery for granted. See, there's three parts in this metaphor. You've got a gardener, a plant, and branches. And let's look at a gardener today. Let's look at it in today's terms. We have a gardener, somebody who wants to plant a garden. Well, they have a purpose for planting, don't they? They usually plant a vegetable garden so that they can grow vegetables. Easy enough, simple enough, that's the idea. So what a gardener will do is he will prepare soil, right? He'll take time to dig into the ground to loosen that soil up so that eventually the seed can take root, those roots can spread. He'll fertilize it, make sure that the conditions are perfect so that that plant can grow into what that gardener intends it to be. Ultimately, to bear fruit. To be fruitful, to have vegetables, if you will. So the gardener will take time to do this and, and he'll plant this seed and the seed will take root and he'll sprout up. And the gardener's work is still not done. Anybody who does gardening will know it's a daily task. You've got to take care of things. You've got to protect that plant from rabbits, other critters that might come in there. You've got to protect it. You've got to provide for it. You've got to nurture it, feed it, water it, fertilize it. And eventually what will happen is this sprout will come out of the ground, this vine, and there'll be two different types of shoots oftentimes you'll see that the the roots of the plant will draw nourishment from the soil and throughout every branch or everything that comes off that stem off of that vine it'll send that nourishment but some of those branches aren't healthy they're dried up they're withered so what the gardener will do is he'll pull off those branches so that nourishment isn't wasted on those unfruitful branches all the nourishment would go to the branches that are going to bear fruit. And even on those fruit-bearing branches, even those healthy branches will sometimes have leaves that wither and die, things that aren't going to bear fruit. So even on those fruitful branches, the gardener will have to trim back sometimes so that even more fruit can grow. That's the imagery that Jesus is using here to explain what he does and the work of the Father. Jesus says that he's the vine, that the Father is the vine dresser, and that we are branches and that we're either going to bear fruit or we're not. And there's a process, and we'll get back to that process in a minute. But to understand what Jesus is talking about, we need to understand what fruit is. Because apparently we're supposed to be fruitful. So what does this fruit look like? What is this fruit that Jesus is talking about? I think there's no more clearer place in Scripture as to exactly what fruit is than in the book of Galatians. Paul writes in the book of Galatians chapter 5 exactly what the fruit of the Spirit is. This is verse 22 through 24. Paul writes, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's, those who belong to Jesus the Christ, they've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is the fruit that Jesus is talking about. That as people, as branches, God's intention for us as the gardener, His creative and redemptive purposes for us is that we would be fruitful and bear fruit for His kingdom. From the beginning of time, God wanted us to be fruitful and to multiply. There's always fruit imagery in God's created order. And in God's redemptive order, through Jesus Christ, through the true vine, we're to bear fruit for His kingdom. And this is what the fruit is, what we just read. Now those would be what Jesus is saying is the branch that bears fruit. But what about the other branch that he talks about? We said there's two kinds of branches, that that bears fruit and that which does not, that the gardener will throw away. We see that in this same passage of Scripture going back a couple verses. This is the works of the flesh. 
It says now, this is verse 19, chapter 5 of Galatians. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. And he goes on to say, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Folks, that is the nature of human beings living in a fallen world. As fallen people, apart from Jesus Christ, apart from the nourishment of the true vine entangled in our lives, apart from a relationship with the true vine, this is the fruit that human beings bear. All these works of the flesh, if you look at them and spend some time examining them, you'll notice something. They're all self-centered. Every single one of them revolves around us, what we like, what feels good. If it feels good, do it. Anybody remember that saying from the 70s? If it feels good, it must be right. We should do it. Those are the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness. Those are the things, the fruit that we bear apart from the vine. And going back to the text from today, verse 2 says this, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. In other words, we're here. Jesus Christ is the vine. and We've got a relationship with him. It's one of acceptance or it's one of rejection. Once we hear the gospel, we're held accountable for that. We either accept that gospel or we reject it. Those who reject it, Jesus is not going to transform. We're going to continue to live by the works of the flesh. We're going to continue to do what we think is right in our own eyes, which is not the intention of God. The intention of God is that we be fruitful. Not that we do the works of the flesh. Going back to Galatians, it says in verse 24, those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and that is the work of the vine. That is the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ transforms us. A relationship with Jesus Christ will help us to crucify, get rid of the works of the flesh and replace it with the fruits of His Spirit. What He wants us to do. And that's His power alone to give. And that's what He provides for us as the true vine. John 15, chapter 8 says this, My Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Folks, we talked a little bit earlier about this imagery and what a gardener does. And he takes those branches that are just not simply going to bear any fruit. He takes those people who are simply not going to accept Jesus and there will be a time of judgment and those branches will be cast away apart from Jesus. But he also says this, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. See, there's something that we need to realize as Christians. Even though we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, even though we're connected to this true vine, a vine that nourishes us, strengthens us according to His Word, gives us wisdom, gives us strength, we still fall short. We still have things in our own lives that need to be pruned back so that we can be even more fruitful. We hold on to sin sometimes despite our best intentions. We have sin in our lives. We have deceit in our lives. We have those things that are the works of the flesh. Try as we may to get rid of them as fallen human beings. We're going to have them. But through the vine, through our faith in Jesus Christ, we can ask God to forgive us. Jesus intercedes on our behalf. And God prunes those sins away from our life. He forgives us and allows us to bear more fruit. How precious that if we would just say, stay connected to that vine, if we would seek Jesus Christ in everything we do, He cleanses us of all our iniquities, of all the bad stuff He gets rid of, but He keeps
keeps the good so that we can be even more fruitful. Folks, in terms of a vine, a vine is intertwined with everything. You ever try to, well, if you ever go to the parsonage, you look out back on that fence, there's grapevines growing all over that fence. I can't imagine trying to get rid of those vines. Have y'all ever tried to get rid of vines? Man, they attach to everything. They're tough, aren't they? And Jesus says the true vine, try as you may to get rid of him, he's there. He's always there. He's in every aspect of our lives. And that's by the design of the master gardener, God the Father himself, planted Jesus Christ when the time was right, sent him to this world. John 3, 17 tells us not to condemn the world, but so that the world could be saved through him. There's a redemptive purpose in Jesus Christ. Paul writes about this in the book of Colossians, one of my favorite passages of scripture. And to me, I had to share it today because... I think it speaks of this intertwining nature of a vine, how it's involved and engulfed in everything. This is Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15 and following. It says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And Christ is before all things, and in him all things consist. He's the head of the church, the body, who is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, that in him he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. You see, when you read this passage, when I read it, I can't help but get the picture that Jesus is involved in every aspect of our lives. Everything, whether we see him or not. He's there. And he's got nothing but good in mind for us. And it's up to us to embrace that, to celebrate that, and to seek his will for our lives, what he'd have us do. Verse 20 talks about the redemptive purpose of Christ. It says that God chose him by Christ to reconcile all things to himself. By Christ, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Those works of the flesh that we talked about, the human nature, the fallen nature, absent of Jesus Christ, you were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now you've been reconciled in the body of Christ's flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight work of the vine the work of the true vine is to restore us to bear fruit for the kingdom of God to be the image of God that God created us to be way back in the beginning to reflect who he is through Christ through the true vine through his nourishment we can be the people of God that God intends us to be but we've got to choose to do that We've got to choose to be cleansed of this sinful nature. Continuing on in today's text, John chapter 15, verse 3 says, Jesus says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. The command of Jesus Christ is that we be clean. When God speaks, it happens. It's instant. Upon our faith in Jesus Christ, we're cleansed. We're forgiven of our sin. And verse 4 is the command. It says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, we don't use the word abide too very often in 2013. But to abide simply means to accept without objection, to wholeheartedly accept, or to remain or to stay with, to continue on with. Stay with Jesus. Continue on with Jesus. Accept him wholeheartedly without any objection. Abide in Jesus and he will accept us without any objection. It's a two-way relationship. When we unconditionally surrender to the Lordship of Christ, he unconditionally forgives us and cleanses us of our sins. He doesn't just save us a little bit. 
God doesn't save a little bit. God saves completely and totally, wiped clean, without blemish, free from accusation in the eyes of the master of God. Praise God for that. Folks, as we have our time at the end of this worship service today to respond to God, we all need to ask ourselves, what kind of fruit do we bear today? What kind of fruit, when God looks down, does He see in our lives? Because He sees it all. There's nothing hidden from His perfect light. You remember a couple weeks ago, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Nothing is hidden from Him. He has the power to transform us, but we've got to accept that. We've got to choose to abide in Him, and He will transform us from something which we are on our own to something that we are by the grace and power of God. Will you do that? Will you surrender and commit your life to abide in the Lordship of Jesus Christ? If you've never done that, would you today say, God, I surrender my life to you to live for you and to have you live for me? Would you pray that simple prayer? If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, as we hit, sing our hymn of invitation, I'd invite you to come forward. Let me pray with you about that. Folks, many of you are Christians. You've already made that commitment to Jesus Christ. But you've got something in your life that the Father needs to prune today. You've got a sin that you need to get rid of. You've got something that's keeping you apart from God. Would you ask Him today to forgive you of that sin, to give you the power to overcome it? Maybe God has spoken to you in a different way today that you need to make a, a decision for Him that has nothing to do with the message, but the Spirit of God has spoke to you loud and clear. Would you respond to that today? As we sing and, and have a time of celebration, respond as the Lord leads you. If that's in your seat, it's in your seat. If it's up here, it's up here. But don't run from it. Apart from God, we can do nothing. Apart from the power of Jesus Christ, we know what those results are. We're going to be cut apart forever. But through His grace, He sent a Son into this world that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Would you be cleansed by the blood of Jesus today? Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for... We thank you for sending your son into this world, not to condemn us, but so that we could be saved. God, we thank you for, in your perfect time, in your perfect way, you planted the perfect seed that grew into this perfect vine that is Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that through him as the true vine, he can nourish us, strengthen us, teach us, guide us, and offer us eternal life. God, I pray that each and every person in here today would commit anew to reconnect to that vine. That God, everything we say, everything we do would be because of our love for your son. And God, we know that through that, as we bear fruit, as, as the Lord Jesus works to transform our lives, that God, you are brought honor and glory. That you smile upon us as we live out your purpose for us from God, I pray uh, that each and every day, Lord, that we would live for you. And that, God, even right now, that your spirit would speak to your people right here in this sanctuary and stir them to make decisions for you. God, we love you and we thank you. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.